If you asked me a year ago from today to define success, I would have told you that its prominent defining characteristic is money. Having a very successful businessman as a father, an older brother who's at UT Macomb School of Business and an ISM alumni, and a hardworking mother of three is a very high standard to live up to. So I always struggle with, one I with what I wanted to be with, what I wanted to be. I always knew I wanted to be as successful as my family members, but never really knew what my niche was and what I wanted to do. I wanted to make a lot of money, so at first I wanted to be a lawyer because I'm super stubborn and argumentative and they make a ton of money, and then other times I wanted to be a rock star because if Taylor Swift can do it, so can I. But after reevaluating my definition of success, I found out that it's not defined by monetary value. It's defined by happiness, which leads me to my quote for the year. When I was five years old, my mother always told me that happiness was the key to life. When I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wrote down happy. They told me I didn't understand the assignment, and I told them they didn't understand life. Hi, my name is Laura Varis, and when I grow up, I want to be happy. So a little bit about me. Um, this is my second year in ISM. Last year I studied music marketing under the mentorship of Brad Geminder at iHeartMedia. And this year I'm studying entrepreneurship under two mentors, John Martillo and Scotty Landry. I am the president and founder of two clubs here at FHS, Mia Scalifa and Big Sis Little Sis. I'm also a youth leader at my church and my family means the world to me. So here's kind of the lear learning targets laid out of what we're going to be talking about today. So first, entrepreneurship and what it is. Next, my research and interviews that I conducted. Then original work, the mentorship as a whole, and finally, my final product. So first, I want to start with the definition. So what is entrepreneurship? Well, according to Google, the activity of setting up business or businesses taking on risks in the hope of profit. So I really strugg struggled with this because I don't like risks. I like staying in my comfort zone. I don't like the unknown, and I don't like the fear of failure. So I almost changed my topic of study at the beginning of the year. However, I decided to push myself into a new potential and see where it would take me, which led me to my research. So the first thing I learned after learning that I have to take all of these risks is that entrepreneurship is actually on the decline. So that was great. Um, and the reason for that is actually really astounding. It's because of crippling college debt. Our innovators, our future of America, are going to college and getting the education they need, but then they don't have the financials to back up their knowledge and start their own ideas, which is really terrifying and kind of sad if you think about it. Next, I talked about, or I learned about um, the difference between private and public companies. So there's a lot of pros and cons for each. For private, there's limited liability. You're not required to disclose your financial information and you can focus on long-term growth because you don't have to consult with a shareholders board. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, for public companies, you must inform your shareholders so you have to have that kind of mediation between them. However, there's unlimited li liability and it's easier to raise capital and sell securities. And one another, and another interesting thing I learned was the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, I don't think I'm pronouncing that right, but it's basically an act that prevents fraud and embezzlement in financial accounts, um, and it was, um, it was enacted in the early 1900s, which I thought was pretty cool. And then lastly, I learned something that we should all learn, how to be a great entrepreneur if you want to be in the entrepreneurship field. So there's all these different studies and research that you can do about how to be the best, but when it comes down to it, I found that these three questions really were they were really simple and really easy to go by. So the first thing you have to ask yourself is what sucks in my world? Do other people think it sucks? And how much does it suck and what am I gonna do about it? And like Plato said, necessity who is the mother of invention. You don't just wanna make something just to make it. You wanna meet, you wanna meet a need and solve a problem for people. So next, I went on a total of about seven interview, interviews, but I'm only gonna be talking about five of them. Um, so. Uh, these are the five, and my first one was with Joshua Meek. He is the CEO of a li limited liability company called Meek Industries. And in our interview, we talked a lot about goal setting and how important it is to not only set your goals five to 10 years from now, but to set your goals 80 years from now, 100 years from now, when you're sitting in your house with a white picket fence, you know, rocking in your rocking chair on your front porch, 
You want to reflect on all the things that you did well, and you want to reflect and make sure that you lived life to the fullest and took all the risks that you could. So that was definitely a really good first interview to have because you really put me at ease. Next, I talked to, oh, I just messed up my microphone, sorry. Next, I talked to Keith Jacobs, who is the CEO of um, a web design company called Project 202. And he talked a lot about how he didn't really want to be an entrepreneur, but he was kind of thrown into it because of the 2008 recession. Um, but he made the most of it. He took his passion, which was web design, and made it into something of his own, which I thought was really inspiring. Next, I talked to John Martillo, who is the CEO of SignaPay, which is a credit card swiping company. And one thing that I really learned from John was how important it is to stay humble. He started on the, low, on the lowest end of the totem pole, working in a factory in Brooklyn for the longest time, but slowly made connections, worked hard, disciplined himself, and is now the CEO of his own company without even going to college. So that just shows how much hard work and dedication can pay off and how much risks pay off as well. My fourth interview was with Jonathan Hoops, and right now he works at SignaPay Signa with John Martillo, but he actually worked on Wall Street as a research financial advisor for a really long time. And um, one of my biggest weaknesses is finance. So he, we talked a lot about um, how to improve that weakness and how to make me better and practice it all the time. So he literally pulled me behind his computer, laid out an, an entire Excel spreadsheet and said, here, here's what you need to do. Go do this with five other companies and then get back to me. So he was really helpful. And then lastly, my fifth interview was with Joshua Wilson. He is a supervising manager for the Dallas Entrepreneur Center, also known as the DEC. And um, our interview was really cool because I was able to talk to him for a good 15 minutes and kind of get to know his environment and what he does at the DEC. But then I also got to sit in on kind of an event called A Million Cups. And this was kind of a mock of Shark Tank where three people presented their startup ideas and the audience was allowed to ask them questions and kind of pick their brain a little bit. So I thought that was really cool. And um, being able to ask those questions and kind of trip up the people presenting gave me a really good perspective of what it would be like if it was me up there. So then my mentors this year, I have two, I'm very lucky to have two, are John Martillo and Scotty Landry. And the reason Scotty Landry wasn't in my interviews was because we actually didn't go on the interview. I met on a coffee date with um, his daughter, who is my really good friend, Callie Landry, and I was like, Callie, I don't know what to do. All the people I've interviewed, they said they can't be my mentor, and she's like, my dad could do it, and I was like, sign me up. So um, he was super willing to be my mentor right when I asked him, which is amazing, and he has been awesome. He is the CEO of Make-A-Wish in North Texas, so it's really cool to get to know um, the nonprofit side of everything. Um, so my original work. So. In order to introduce my original work, it's important to know kind of the background knowledge behind it. So as we know, Spotify is very popular. It's the leading platform for streaming and artist exposure. It has over 40 million paying subscribers worldwide with over 2 billion playlists and 30 million songs, which is crazy if you think about it. Um, playlists on Spotify are a major vehicle for artists to gain exposure, especially new up and coming artists, especially because it's so large. However, what we don't realize as the average consumer is that there's corruption, and that corruption is called payola. So payola dates back all the way to the 50s, and it's when up-and-coming musicians would pay radio stations to have their song played over and over, and that's kind of how they got popular back in the day. Obviously, it's, it's been outlawed since then, but there's still kind of some under, underground, um, under-the-table kind of works, especially with Spotify. So whenever you go home and listen to your favorite Spotify playlist or the pre-made playlist, just know that the top song on there is probably not because it's super popular, but they'll pay up to $10,000 for a prime spot on a playlist, which is crazy to me. Um, and the next, radio. So contrary to popular belief, radio is not dead. Over 93% of millennials are listeners, with 265 million Americans per week and 66 million Generation X per week. So while we think it's on the decline because of all these advancements in technology and streaming playlists like Spotify, it's actually not. We actually spend a lot of time on the radio. But a con to the radio is that we don't really have a say in what songs we want to get played. As a generation that likes instant demand, we like to get to pick whatever we want to hear. So that's kind of a con to the radio that we still listen to. 
So now you kind of see the dilemma. Spotify is corrupt, and radio stations don't play what we truly want. It seems like nothing can be done until now. Enter Waves. So Waves is a prototype for a payola-free music platform that allows up-and-coming musicians exposure through radio play. So what I did is I built the, oh, I'm so sorry, this prototype for the website. So let's say um, there's two different versions that you could go on. So let's say you're a musician or a listener. If you're either, you would go ahead and log in or sign up. Let's say we already have an account. Enter your username or password. And then you have four options on the home screen. If you want to upload your music, you can do so. Go to your profile, browse new music, and go to your stream. So we're going to go to our profile. And let's say we're John Doe, and we're a musician. So here we have all of our original music that we can listen to that we uploaded, as well as a bio and our statistics. And there's a good um, little button to upload music as well. Now let's say you're just a listener, and you just want to upload, or you don't want to upload, and you just want to listen to other people's songs and stream them like Spotify. So you can listen to any song on the app and make your own playlist with them. Let's say you want a relaxation playlist, acoustic vibes, all those different stuff. You have your statistics as well. And then if we go over here, you can look at all your playlists in one area, all your uploads if you're a musician, and all your loves. So if we go back to the home screen, so this is where it kind of um, has a unique aspect to it. So let's say your favorite genre is hip hop. If you want to listen to hip hop, you go to the genre and you listen to all the songs and then you pick on your favorite. You can vote unlimited times and then one vote equals, or one love, excuse me, equals one vote. So at the end of each week, let's say at the end of every Friday at 5 p.m., the song with the most votes for each genre gets played on the radio. So we finally get a say on what we get to play. And then if you really like this song by Jane Doe, let's say her song Watermelon or whatever it's called is so good, you can listen to her or you can go to her profile and then kind of explore and see more of her music, see her playlist, you can follow her playlist as well, and you can see her statistics as well. And then what's really cool, um, and it's a different feature than Spotify and all the other streaming playlists, is that you can track your activity. So you can see what you're currently listening to, a track that you loved five minutes ago, if you forget and you want to go back and listen to it. So this was the prototype that I built. And then, oh no, what did I do? So yeah, so that was my original work, and I had a lot of fun making it just because I got to explore kind of what I did last year in music marketing and explore even further in terms of entrepreneurship, was, which was really cool. So next I'm going to be talking about my mentorship. And so on this slide, I will have my mentor pictures, but I don't have my mentor pictures yet, so just, <laughs> yeah. But um, I had the ability to have two mentors, like I said. Uh, John Martillo, who is the CEO of SignaPay, and then Scotty Landry, who is the CEO of Make-A-Wish North Texas. And a lot of our mentor visits were the same in, uh, in regards to the layout of it. So entrepreneurship deals a lot with talking and pitching your ideas and coming up with innovative ways to get people to invest in your product. So um, a lot of the things that we did was work on my final product and kind of talk through the nitpicky things and make sure there was no holes and make sure that I was knowledgeable enough about my own product to present to somebody else. Which leads me to my final product. So I'm coming up with a total of three business plans. The reason you only see two at the moment was because my mentors thought that I could improve upon the last one, so I'm kind of scratching that and starting over. So that's not complete yet. But I'm, uh, in the end, I will have three business plans where I kind of develop everything that needs to be done. So the revenue model, the commission standards, the internal controls, everything that goes into developing a business. And um, yeah, so I'm going to be exploring um, one of them right now, Virtual Me, since we already talked about Waves. And I actually developed an entire PowerPoint. And it's a little lengthy, so we're going to shorten it a little bit. Okay, so 
so virtual me. So we're going to be talking about the overview of competitors, financials, goals, marketing implications, different stuff like that. But first, you're probably wondering, what is virtual me? So have you ever been to a clothing store, gone to the fitting room, and you just hate going to the store? Like, we don't even shop in stores anymore. We shop, all we do is online. Brick and mortar is vanishing. So you go to a fitting room, and you don't like how it fits, or you shop online, and you return your clothes because it doesn't fit right, and you don't know your size in that um, industry. So this is where virtual me comes into play. So the first thing you do was, would be step into a body scanner that would be located at the retail stores. Then you connect your body scan to an email and password at, a local, at whatever retail store you're working with. So for this example, we're using H&M. And then from H&M's website, you can shop online which are with a virtual model of yourself instead of looking at everybody else in the clothes. Um, and you can see where it fits too tight, too loose, and just right. So this is what the website would look before. And then with your clothing, that's what it would look like after. <laughs> it's like a Photoshop version of it, but you get the gist. <laughs> so our goals and missions are to partner with a major retailer and reduce returns. Also create a platform that connects consumers to multiple retailers and eventually promote a sense of self-empowerment for consumers. Because when we're shopping online and we get the clothing and we finally try it on, we kind of get discouraged and we're like, you know what, maybe this store isn't for me. So we're really reducing those return rates for competitors and um, promoting a sense of self-empowerment. So the technology is actually already there. We're not a technology-based company. We're using, um, we're actually patenting two different softwares. So the first one is SciStream, and that's the actual body scanner. Um, and then Optitex, which is the software that our soft en software engineers will work to accommodate to SciStream in order to tell model, or to tell the people where it fits too tight, too loose, and just right. And one thing I also like to note is that body scanning and um, kind of fitting clothes to a virtual scan is not foreign to the retail industry, especially in clothing, because that's how designers design their clothing. They just don't use an accurate representation of the average person, if that makes sense. So retail market statistics, so 30% of online retail purchases are returned, which is crazy um, because a lot of retail stores are trying to reduce the return rates, but it's really hard if people aren't happy with their product. And then 79% of clothing returns are due to fitting issues. Um, competition, so all of the competition, direct and indirect, is um, some form of technology based on fitting and scanning, but there's nothing that allows people to let you know where it fits too tight, too loose, or just right. If there was, you have to input your measurements by yourself, which kind of defeats the purpose. Um, and so our marketing strategy is to kind of enter into um, the market through a big publicity stunt. So you would do a New York fashion show with H&M where you would be showing how the virtual scanner works and then the actual person would be walking out in the clothes that actually fit them. And then we have 10 initial store locations that um, are prime spots for people, kind of like tourist attractions, to try out the product, see how they like it, and then kind of grow from there for, through word of mouth. And then I talk about the management structure, financials. So we have a 3% commission revenue model where we'd be taking 3% of all um, sales that are produced through our product online, um, which is quite generous and what it is what I could come up with that would be most reasonable for retail stores to partner with us. And then the last thing we wanted to do was grow and eventually philanthropically um, affiliate ourselves with a self-esteem partnership in order to really promote that growth of self-empowerment. And so we came up with the offering of 1.5 million over two years. Um, and yeah, that's virtual me. So that's one of the ideas that I came up with for my final product. Like I said, I have two other ones. Um, but yeah. And then going back to this. OK. So obviously, like I said, all the things that I'm doing are very risky. But after completing my original or my final product and all this work throughout the year, I really learned a lot about myself. I learned how to stay organized, develop an idea to its full potential, and really narrow down, narrow down good ideas from a bad one. However, most importantly, I learned the significance of taking risks. Opportunities are limited, and staying within a bubble of comfort is boring. 
As cliche as it sounds, we only live once, so it's important to make every choice count. Which is why I'll be taking the great, greatest risk of all in attending Berklee College of Music in the fall, located in Boston, Massachusetts, double majoring in music business and songwriting. It's risky, trust me, I know. Going to music school is crazy. But if there's one thing I learned, it's that risks always pay off one way or another. They always make you grow, and they always fill you with priceless experiences. I want to take the time now to thank everyone that has helped me get to where I am. My family, my friends, my teacher, Coach Goff, thank you so much for always believing in me. And most importantly, to my mentors. I cannot thank y'all enough for taking time out of your insanely busy schedules to help me grow as an aspiring entrepreneur. Before you all go, I want to leave you with this. How do you define success? Is it money, social status? Just know at the end of the day, materialism will never fulfill you as much as happiness will. Thank you.